Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Brandon Borseth. I'm one of the elders here at Harvest Bible Chapel. Um, you get me this week, uh, Terry. Um, his daughter had a desire to see the ocean, and it was her 16th birthday. And so he's organized a wonderful trip for them. We're excited for them. We're praying their travels are safe and that that time is just very, very special for their family, that they grow closer together, and then they come back refreshed and recharged so we can put him back to work. So <laughs> as he is out, um, you're stuck with me for now, but I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible with you today, um, it's very, very important to us that you've got one that you can follow along. If you look under the seats in front of you, um, there should be some Bibles there. Look to the left or to the right if it's not right in front of you. You can find Romans chapter 8. We'll be in verse 18, and it's on page 944 if you are looking inside of one of those black Bibles. So as we're kind of flipping through, have you ever, show of hands, have you ever used the phrase, it doesn't matter? Like, whatever, this is fine, it doesn't matter, this is not a big deal. Could be about something small, about something that you wish was smaller, or my favorite is something you know is smaller, and you're struggling to help someone else understand that it is that small. Um, if you have children, you have dealt with this on a variety of occasions, I am sure. But what matters to people it can be really, really different. So first example, I'm going to take some low-hanging fruit here. Organization. To some people, that matters a lot. And if you are one of those people, I lovingly am telling you, do not come to my office. Just don't. It's going to raise your anxiety level. It's going to raise my anxiety level. It's not going to be healthy for anyone. Now, that's a small thing in the grand scheme of things, provided my organizational structure doesn't cause the wheels to fall off something else. But... That's just one example of where we put our priority on what wet matters to us, what really matters, what kind of matters, what's not as big of a deal. You see, when it comes to the ins and outs of everyday life, we're going to have different priorities on what we think matters and what doesn't. And if in the back of your mind, whatever you're doing, whatever you're thinking, you're thinking to yourself, what's the point? Why, is, why does this matter? Odds are you're probably not giving your best effort or your best attitude, or at the very least, the final product isn't something that's going to win you any awards. But no matter what we do, we, we want to matter. We want to feel like our life is important. We want to feel like what we're doing makes a difference. And when we don't feel like that, it's a recipe for depression, for pain, both for us and for the people around us. So it's my hope today and next week as we walk through these passages in Romans that we really find what matters. And so I want to start with this thought today. Our lives matter most when we embrace and reflect God's love. I want to encourage you to keep that in the back of your mind. I'm going to start reading in Romans chapter 8. This is verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope in what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know to pray as for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified... He also glorified. Please pray with me this morning. Father, you love us with a love that we can't fully understand, and yet you embrace us with it. Give us this time together to focus on what truly matters. Open our hearts to embrace your love and your word. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
So as we dig in, there was a lot there, and some of it may have felt a little bit wordy to you, and that's okay, but we're going to get right into this. So the first thing in this passage that Paul wants to show us is that perspective matters, and we're going to get the rough one out of the way right now. This can be a stumbling block for many of us. He comes out saying right in the beginning of that passage that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. This, this can be a radical shift in perspective, especially in the moment. Trying to view the world as God sees it and how he sees us, that can be really, really hard, especially when we're frustrated or sad or upset about something. What matters a lot to us may not hold nearly that kind of weight compared to the glory that is to come. How many times has one of your kids come to you with a problem that is absolutely dominating their entire existence? They cannot move on with life until this gets handled. And when you look at it, you're like, this is barely a paper cut on the road of your existence, child. You won't remember this at the end of the day, let alone tomorrow. But the same thing can be true for us. As adults, it's hard sometimes. Look at some of the major moments in your life and the decisions that you made or you will make, or maybe you're about to make? Are you trying to avoid some sort of difficulty or suffering in this life at the expense of the glory that is to come? Are you allowing a trial in this life to damage your relationship with the Almighty instead of strengthening it? Because the enemy is going to use every tragedy, every circumstance, every difficulty in your life to try and distort and twist and pervert your perspective of your Lord and Savior. Paul says that the sufferings of this life, he's talking about a blanket statement that refers to any tragedy, any harm, anyone can endure. And let's be honest, there are some hard things in life. Health scares, fertility issues, infidelity, sudden tragedy, that phone call you never expected to get, at, and there's never a good time for those. That list goes on and on and on. But we have to acknowledge that life isn't always going to go in the direction that we want it to. And every time, God is there saying, I know, I know. It's, it's this world. It, every substitute that it has for, for peace, for love, for comfort, it's cheap, it's empty, it's going to leave you sad, it's going to leave you depressed, and it's never going to fulfill the need that you have in that moment. But God is also saying to you, his glory, his love, his peace, his comfort, it's perfect, it's priceless, it's powerful, and that, that is what matters. That's what will make your life matter. By embracing the one that saw fit to knit you together in your mother's womb. If he is willing to take that kind of care and time with you, of course he thinks you matter. The perspective that looks to God and his glory in all circumstances is so great that the whole of creation waits with eager longing. That's what the passage says. Eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. All of creation is looking for who says yes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's hungry for it. This is a longing and it's going to far outweigh dad on Christmas Day like making you wait till the end to open the big present. Like, that's a really tiny thing compared to the world aching and longing for more believers in Jesus Christ. It's a longing that sees everything else in this world as futility compared to the hope of being set free. Now, quick, say, free from what? I'm so glad you asked. Verse 21 says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. Other places in Scripture refer to it as a slave to sin. I feel like we sang about that a little bit earlier today. Jesus Christ, he breaks those chains and instead gives freedom and glory to the children of God. And it's not just creation that longs for this. He says that we do too. Do you have that one friend, that one person in your life that just keeps trying to fill their problem with something that the world gives them? Something that's empty? that they just recycles through and then they just return back to it and it seems like they're moving further and further down a road that they can't come back from. That's God putting a longing in your heart to see them come to that saving knowledge of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's calling you to embrace that love and to love on them. Invite them into that loving relationship. Maybe today you're like, that's not my friend, that's me. And if that's you today, Jesus is calling out to you. 
He says, I love you. Everything on this world is going to leave you sad and disappointed and empty, but his love is perfect. His comfort is perfect, and he will prepare a place for you with the Almighty because this life doesn't hold near the weight of the glory that is to be revealed. Verse 23 calls it the first fruits of the Spirit. We get this little taste of the love of God. We get a little glimpse of the glory of Christ. And that should change our perspective on this entire world. And when perspectives don't match up, that's when we start to have problems. The people that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, or let's be honest, the individuals that just straight up hate him. This kind of change in perspective leads to misunderstanding, misrepresentation, mistrust. And Paul knew it was coming. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, he said, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's a difficult thing to look at, a difficult thing to swallow. But when your perspective starts with what is heavenly, with what God wants for you in your life, then it's going to seem like, a stumbling block to those that don't fully understand. It's going to seem like folly to people that have never heard it before. You're doing what? And you've heard these things before. I've had someone say to me before, why are you going to church? You're coughing up a day that you could sleep in. And you need extra sleep, buddy. (laughs) Why are you getting up early to pray? Remember that sleep we talked about? Now you're getting up early. You're wasting even more time. Now you're more tired all day long. Why are you doing this? Wait, wait, wait. You're not, and I've heard this one before, and i I didn't know how to respond to it at the time. You're not one of those weird Christians that like actually gives money to church sometimes, are you? (laughs) Sometimes it's said out of confusion. Sometimes it's said as a loving like little rib at you. Sometimes it's downright nasty. But the perspective that I believe is slowly becoming the most damaging to our relationship with Christ is this. And I truly believe this is going to become the heresy of this age. Do what's right for you. You do you, men. You must do what you think is best. Only problem is, what you see as right for you, that want you have, that desire you feel, that may not be what's right or best for your wife, for your husband, for your children, for your friends, or for your coworkers. But that perspective that puts you in the center and says you first and you feel this way and you need to make sure that you make that decision that you feel is right for you takes out everyone else from the equation. But you don't just live by yourself. You live surrounded by others. And we need that perspective that Jesus Christ says, I have died for you and I love you. And God says, I will guide you. My word is a light to you. It'll, be a, it'll guide your path. At the end of this section, Paul says that who hopes in what they see. And he's talking about everything here on earth. But our hope, if it's in this earth and this life, the hope is going to pass away, just like everything on this earth is going to pass away. So, question for you again. Who is our hope in? It's in Jesus Christ. It's his salvation where we place our faith. It's where we place our hope. If you look at your life through the perspective that Jesus Christ died for you, you're going to start making your decisions with the perspective that Jesus loves you. And we serve him. So, the question that comes up next is, well, what do we do if we're not sure if our perspective's on target? What if I do, I don't know what the right thing is to do here. Well, we addressed that too. It's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Can you make a biblical case for the decision you're about to make? Don't ask yourself, What would Jesus do? First off, your bracelet from the 90s probably doesn't fit anymore. And more than that, we need to be remembering what Jesus did for us. That's what's going to shape our perspective. That's what's going to give everyone around you another measure of hope, another measure of comfort, another measure of peace, and they'll begin to feel that love radiate out from you. And it'll make them ask the question, why do you have hope right now? I have seen your life and it's a mess. (laughs) Hopefully they say it nicer than that to you. And then when you embrace that love, you can then speak to them. I sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I would love to share more of that with you. Come to church with me. Come to that night of worship if you don't want to come on Sunday morning, if you're just not ready to wake up yet. (laughs) We have opportunities. But when we need 
those things. When we need God's perspective, we pray. And that's because prayer matters. And I am relatively confident that I have hit on prayer probably every single time I've had the opportunity to share with you. So I'm just going to keep the train rolling. (laughs) Number two is prayer matters. It matters so much because everywhere in Scripture you can see it. Jesus himself prayed for you. Every time Paul planted a church and inside of every single one of his letters, he is praying for the people of God. And now in this passage, you get the Holy Spirit praying for you. And I'm a lot really excited about this because this is God's Holy Spirit. Now, to set it up, Paul Paul starts out by saying, "Ah, you guys, you're not so good at prayer. And that's kind of a hit. But he says, he calls it a weakness. But then he goes on to say, you know, you don't really pray like you should. Now, that can be depressing for us. But don't lose hope, friends, because remember, we hope in what we don't see. And there are three best parts about prayer in this. Remember a week ago, I said, even if you think you're bad at praying, y'all got to pray anyway. Well, here's best part number one. The Spirit helps us in prayer. If you feel like you're no good at praying, no problem. Apparently, that's he's referring to all of us anyway. Check out verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. We don't have time for the, for the tongues aspect of this passage. We'll get there another time, and the theology behind that is fun and controversial, and we'll fight about it later. But think about how phenomenal this is. Every time you pray, Holy Spirit right next to you, I, I imagine an arm around you, I really can't say, but the Holy Spirit right there, every single time you pray, amen, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, they're coming before you. They're acknowledging this sin in their life. Lord, they're looking for help for their friend. They're looking for your love in their community. And then every once in a while, "Mm, God, that's not exactly what they meant. What they really meant was this. For a great example of that, when we began our adoption journey, I did not pray, Lord, in three years, please bless us with twins. Uh, That was not how that prayer began. But what did God know? He knew that road and that Holy Spirit. Every time I said, Lord, please guide us in our adoption journey. Lord, please help us not to lose heart. Lord, please help us not to lose hope. The Holy Spirit was right there next to me every time saying, oh God, he doesn't know yet, but this is going to be amazing. And that's why we don't always see that answer as fast as we think or in the picture that we thought it would be. It's our perspective. We need to open it up. We need to look for what God has for us. And that's best part number two. You have the ultimate prayer warrior by your side. It says shapes our prayer. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. The ultimate prayer warrior by your side, crafting your prayer, shaping your prayer, ultimately making it so powerful that it's words that we can't even understand. Here in the passage, he calls it groanings too deep for words. The Spirit isn't just helping your prayer. He's shaping it into something that's going to go before the Lord Almighty. That's a big deal. Best part number three, that the Spirit knows God's will. Anybody ever think like, God, show me your will inside of your prayer life? And he was like, I just want to know what you want for me, God. You've got the Holy Spirit right there. Every time you say, I want to know, the Spirit is there and knows that will. It says in verse 27, he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Even in the garden, as Jesus is about to be betrayed, he says, not my will, Lord, but your will. Every time. When you say in your prayer, Lord, help me know your will in my circumstance. Holy Spirit's like, got his hand up in the air, shaking all crazy like that kid in second grade that is absolutely certain of the right answer. Holy Spirit's like, I got this part. They say, Lord, show me your will. Holy Spirit's like, God, I know your will. Let's make this happen. When you embrace and reflect God's love, you're going to understand that perspective shift. You're going to understand that your prayer matters. And you're going to be confident every time you pray in the name of Jesus Christ because he made a way for you to get to the Father, the God Almighty who loves you with a love that you can't grasp or understand. And the Holy Spirit is going to be right next to you, shaping and guiding that prayer. That's all three right there. We're praying to God our Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And when we're not doing everything just right, you have a Holy Spirit that's going to help it get to that spot. The back half of James chapter 5, verse 16 sums it up well when he says the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I struggled with that verse for a long time because I was like, well, I got to make sure my prayer is righteous so that it can work really great. But it's not about my prayer. 
It's about me going before the Lord and saying, God, I love you. God, help me understand this. And the Holy Spirit saying, I'm going to make this way powerful. And you watch what's going to happen. When we do that, church, we're going to open our eyes and watch for even more of those first fruits we talked about, that glimpse of God's glory, that taste of his love, and stories that are going to blow you away. We'll find perspective that matters when we commit to prayer that we know matters. And when we do that, we're going to find that our purpose matters. You know how people have like on decor in their homes, they have like a Bible verse on the wall or above their door, things like that. Well, that's biblical, by the way. So if you find one you really like, absolutely. Verse 28 of this passage is on ours. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. When our perspective seeks the kingdom of God and his righteousness, when we pray like it matters, God will define our purpose in a way like never before. And notice he said, all things. Sometimes, that good in our lives, we only feel that good and that success because we know, we know how low that valley can be. We know how hard it was. Your salvation is all the more precious when you understand how awful your sin was and about how much Christ saved you out of it. God loves his own son, right? So, verse 29, take a look at with me quickly. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God loves you. God loves you enough to make you a brother with Jesus Christ. He is adopting you into his family. That makes you an image bearer of Jesus Christ. He says you're that sibling. You're in that family. He's calling you to a purpose. It says here that he justifies the purpose, and you pursue that purpose like it matters. Paul says even more glory is going to be revealed. So, what is your purpose? It's a million-dollar question. Since I hit 190's reference already, I'm not going to ask you to read Rick Warren's book to find out what your purpose-driven life is going to be. Jesus said it himself, though. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. You see, purpose was never a career or a certain number of children or this glorious accomplishment in your life or this legacy that you were going to leave. It's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I just said, purpose isn't about your job or your family or your accomplishments. Make God's love your purpose, and you're going to see him work in your job, in your family, in those accomplishments. Watch that perspective change, but it's not just going to be in those things where we tend to find joy. He's also going to work in your struggles. He's going to work in your pain. He's going to work in your heartache because he said all things for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That means you choose God's love. And when you do that, your perspective is going to change. You're going to find that that perspective matters in a way like never before. And you're going to pray like every word you speak matters to the Lord. And when you do that, you're going to find that purpose revealed. And you're going to find something glorious inside of it here on earth that's going to give you just that glimpse of his glory, just that taste of his love. And it's going to be enough to spur you on to love and good deeds like never before. That's what happens to make your life matter most when you embrace and reflect God's love. So as the worship team comes forward, we're going to pray. But before we do, I want to encourage you to close your eyes for a moment. I know, you're like that kid in like third grade who didn't want to close their eyes because they wanted to see what everybody else's vote was. <laughs> At least put your head down. Just a moment where you can be just you. Let the Spirit search your heart. Is God's love calling out to you today? Is your heart ready to say yes to Jesus Christ? Pray that he would lead you up here after the service. Pray with our elder and his wife who will be here. Pray with me and believe on Jesus Christ. Maybe in your heart, the Spirit is showing you where your perspective needs to shift, where your prayer needs to increase, or where you simply need God's love to fuel your purpose.
Father, you tell us over and over again that you love us. You've shown us over and over again how much we matter to you. Lord, inside of this life, we ask for a new perspective that comes from trusting you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask that you give us that time in prayer that helps us to learn and grow, that helps us to seek after you, and it guides us in loving others like you love us. Lord, we ask that you give us love inside of every purpose you task us with. You are our God. And in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.